Well, thanks for that introduction. I like to hear myself talk, too. I think that's how I ended up with this job. Several years ago, I was running to be the vice president of OCPAC. And my campaign platform to be vice president was that if elected, I promised to always wear overalls when substituting for Charlie. And I faithfully upheld that pledge for many years. And whenever I stepped in for Charlie, I wore overalls. And then we would get all these jokes about how much weight I had lost and I, was I dyeing my beard now and all this kind of stuff. But now that I'm the president of OCPAC, I have hung up those overalls out of respect, honor, and tribute to the man who began this club some 26 years ago. Not this club, but OCPAC. And so Charlie had his overalls. I have my sandals. We are two different guys. And as a matter of fact, we don't always agree with each other. Uh, you may have noticed that when we published Charlie's picks for the last few election cycles, Charlie had certain things that he would say, and then sometimes I would add a little twist to that. Like, hey, this is the way I see it. So uh, I'm a little bit more libertarian than Charlie is, and we have some different views. But goodness gracious, on 96% of things we agree, and certainly he still serves on the board of OCPAC and tells me which end is up, and when he says jump, I say how high. So that's the way that works. Uh, you know, OCPAC began 26 years ago much the same way High Noon did. It was some friends meeting together, talking about issues that matter to them. And after so many years of doing that, they said, we need to go to a whole new level. It's one thing to sit around in here and itch about what's going on, but what could we do about it? So that's when they formed a PAC about 17, 18 years ago so that they could raise money and actually try and make a difference in policy and make a difference in who gets elected and that kind of thing. And so in some 25 years of Charlie's experience, we saw the legislature uh, turn 70 seats from Democrat to Republican statewide. And so now we're run by Republicans. The bad news is we're still run by crooks. A crook by any other letter is still a crook, you know. So we don't hire, we don't elect political parties, we elect people. And it's very important that we elect people of character. We see throughout the course of human events that when the righteous are in power, then we rejoice and the people are blessed. And when the wicked are in power, we suffer. And right now we suffer a lot. Some people, we're all enslaved. We are slaves of the state, but most people just don't even realize how enslaved they are because they don't get up off the couch to do anything or try to do anything. If they did, if they wanted to get up off the couch and start a business and try and be a productive member of society, they would immediately have to start jumping through regulatory hoops and paying taxes and doing all of these things that makes people throw up their hands and give up and sit back down on the couch. So I've got our mission statement up here on the board. It says that this is what we're about. We promote and support public servants who oppose expansive government while promoting liberty, free markets, and Judeo-Christian standards. Okay, so I want to talk to you for a few minutes about how we are accomplishing our mission at OCPAC. You might recognize this stadium. It looks like thousands of stadiums across the nation where people worship, I mean, uh, get entertained at a regular uh, time on Fridays and Saturdays. This is MetLife Stadium. I've called it Pan Am. Now, does anybody know what Pan Am is? Pan Am is the name of the uh, fictional country in the Hunger Games where people are entertained by people killing each other. Sound familiar? The gladiator ring and what the Romans did. Okay, that nation in that book is called Pan Am on purpose because that comes from the, la the Latin. Pan Am et circuses. Bread and circuses. Food and entertainment. We're all so busy talking about OU football and the Dallas Cowboys and eating our hamburgers and pizza and drinking beer that we don't realize how enslaved we are. And so we know that there's this kind of social understanding in our nation and in our culture that you could talk about sports and you could talk about the weather. That's safe. You're not going to cause a brouhaha. And what are you supposed to avoid? Religion and politics. Ladies and gentlemen, religion and politics are the only two things that matter. Think about this for a moment. The Ten Commandments. Commandments number one through five have to do with how you relate to your God. That's religion. Commandments six through ten have to do with how we relate to each other in community, in civil society. That's politics. God says the only two things that matter are religion and politics. 
Jesus said it himself. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Again, commandments one through five. And the second is like it. Treat your neighbor the way you want to be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. Commandments six through ten. So when I come into a room of people, I only mention sports and the weather as a means to get to religion and politics. Because that's what really matters. So today let's talk about some things that matter. Uh, when we look across Oklahoma, we have some 3.8 to 3.9 million people living in the state. That is a relatively small state. Most major cities across the country outnumber our entire state. Uh, that's roughly the size of the Dallas-Fort Worth area is the population of our whole state. I like that. We have a lot of space. That space comes with freedom, less nosiness into your business, and because there are fewer of us, our elected representatives and senators are more likely to listen to us. It's a little bit easier for us to affect change. There's never more than about 3% of people, tops, who are really engaged in the political process that are really uh, making a difference. Now, when you watch the news reports as an example to illustrate this, and they talk about so-and-so received... 53% of the vote, and he's going to be the new representative in this area. How many people is he going to represent? Well, if he's a rep, somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 35,000, right? How many people do you think actually voted for that guy? A few hundred to a thousand to 1,200 maybe. That's how many people it takes to get a representative who's going to elect 35,000 people, and then he's going to make rules that all of us have to live up under, right? So that's both bad news because people aren't paying attention, and that's kind of a travesty. But it's also good news, because it means that if we can recruit enough salty, bright people from the churches of Oklahoma who understand the principles of good government, that we can make a difference. That's how people like Dan Fisher and Jason Murphy get elected, because they're communicating and recruiting believers and followers one-on-one -on -one to go vote for me. And then he can stand for righteousness in the place where the laws of our state are made. So that's kind of good news. When I look across the grassroots of Oklahoma, when I look at that 1% to 3% of people who are really making things happen politically in our state, I see them in different little Indian tribes, if you will. So when, as we consider the grassroots of conservatism in Oklahoma, you might have one tribe of folks that is dialed in on the precious lives of unborn human beings who are murdered in the womb by abortion. There's a lot of different uh, abortion groups. I actually am the director of Oklahomans United for Life, one of those groups. And there are several others. And we each have our own niches, if you will, for how we're fighting that battle, trying to make a difference at a grassroots level and also at a shoots, shoots and leaves level, trying to change public policy. So there's that tribe. Then you've got a tribe of people that I call JBS. That's the John Birch Society. They're very focused on preserving our constitutional republic. Good group of folks there. You've got another tribe that is focused on the Second Amendment, making sure that we can all defend ourselves with appropriate weapons. You've got folks like the 912ers, the Tea Party groups, and the Libertarians. I kind of lump them together because they're all a kind of conspiracy theorists. And I got news for you. It is a conspiracy. They're right. I really identify with that tribe of people. You've got those who are focused on education and the rights of parents and the rights of children and education. You've got then the typical traditional GOP activists who are working in the party. They go to the precinct meetings and they're working on making the platform and making the rules and making sure that the Republican Party platform stands for what we stand for in our state. And so there's a lot of activists there. And then you've got the service clubs like the Rotary Club and the Lions Club and the High Noon Club and these places where people get together for community and, so, and to socialize and things like that. And what I see when I consider all these different tribes in Oklahoma, right in the middle of them is OCPAC. Because I know folks in every one of these tribes and they're also in mine at OCPAC. So we're very influential across the state when it comes to getting things done politically. We send our weekly update to about four to 5,000 people, and then they forward it on to their friends and family members. We have 1,000 followers on Facebook. We have about 200 people who pay dues on a regular basis to fund the work of the PAC. Uh, just last year, we raised about $20,000, and that's without anybody asking for money. I'm not paid. I just volunteer my time as the president, and Charlie did the same thing for two decades. And some money comes in. $20,000 is not a lot of money. 
I mean, it would be fun to make this a super PAC and have two or $300,000 to really go after and unseat some people, to make sure certain policies get put forward at the Capitol. I'd like to see that happen someday. That's a vision that I may be thinking about fertilizing and watering. But in the meantime, we are very good stewards of our $20,000, and we load up on a few candidates here and there that we endorse, and we try and get them elected, and we've had some success over the years. So let me talk about... Um, some of our worldview uh, at the members of OCPAC, um, we believe that there should be a correlation between civil law and moral standards. In fact, every candidate who comes to interview with us for our endorsement, we ask this question, should there be a correlation between civil law and moral standards? And then they need to explain after they answer that question. And there is a wrong answer. The wrong answer is no. And so if they get it wrong, we explain the correct answer. And this is how I explain it with this slide right here. You see a square that says civil law. These are the laws passed by our civil magistrates, city, county, state, and on up. And then there's a giant circle that represents really what God sees as right and wrong. Absolute moral standards. And so we try to explain to people who want to make our laws that we're going to live by that we're not asking you to legislate everything that's moral. But please consider that everything you legislate better be moral, or it should not be law at all. And if we can point to an existing law and explain why it is not moral, why it steals from people or destroys their lives or property or businesses, then we need to get rid of that law. What I've just explained to you right there, this is the basis of everything we are about. Everything. Whether it's a person or a policy, a tax, a statute, this, it has to go through this filter, because if it's based on something not moral, it doesn't matter that it brings more tax revenue to the city or more tax revenue to the state. If it did it based on theft, it's wrong, and we shouldn't have done it. So that's our worldview. That's how we make all of our decisions past that. All right, so how do we accomplish our mission? I passed around the room this little uh, membership form. This is really handy because it has on it our mission, and it explains sort of how we are accomplishing it. So let me highlight some of the major things we do throughout the year. First of all, we educate the state on principles of good government. Again, this goes back to you shouldn't kill people and steal their stuff. It's the Ten Commandments. It's the basis of everything. And so you will notice if you're getting our weekly updates or if you're a member of our group on Facebook, then you get those, those updates. I'm writing from that framework. I may be talking about a policy, a proposed law, a legislator, uh, something in the news. But my goal with everything I write is to bring it back to the moral. What is the moral perspective on this? Because I'm not interested in talking about whether or not it will just create more tax revenue or make a special interest group more happy because they got more of our stuff. I want to know, is this right or is this wrong? And so that's a thread you see every week in the things that I write. And I'm trying to push that out to as many people as possible. And I will repeat myself a lot. Because you know what happens? The news changes every week. There's always some new travesty, some stupid story to point at, like the Crooked Oak School District and all of their incompetence and theft and corruption was in the news a couple of weeks ago. So the story might change, but the point doesn't. Theft is wrong. Corruption is wrong. And it's our job. We, the people, must say no. We have to hold evil accountable. We have to hold evil people accountable. We can't just say, oh, you know, I just didn't know any better. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, ignorance is no excuse because guess what? God wrote it on your heart that you shouldn't steal. Just because you can get away with it and think nobody's going to check or there's going to be no state audit doesn't give you the right to hire your son or daughter or girlfriend or whatever for a do-nothing, no-name position in your school district. It's wrong. And that guy needs to be fired. Every last one of them who presides over things like that needs to be fired. But it won't happen unless we're aware of it. Thus, our weekly emails educate the people in the state what's going on and what they should do about it from a moral perspective is what we're trying to do. All right, another one of our tools in our tool bag for accomplishing our mission is to find good candidates. In our state, if you want to represent whether it's the Senate or the House or dog catcher or whatever, you just have to raise a little money and win a beauty contest. In my mind, that's not good enough. 
A good candidate knows what his job is and is going there to do it with honesty and integrity. We have a real problem right now in our culture, and this is nationwide. We do not understand what the word represent or representation means. These guys think, oh, my job is to represent you. Therefore, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. If 50% plus one person in my district wants a certain law or policy, it's my job, as I, since I represent them, to run the bill. That's not representation. Representing you means they stand in your place representing your interests. Your interests are in your life and your property and your freedom. Their job is to represent you and protect you, oftentimes from other parts of government and the federal government. So this idea that representation just means we're going to do whatever the majority wants, that's just tyranny. That's why we aren't a democracy. The whole idea behind being a representative is we would have people of character, would represent our interests, and defend us against theft and death and tyranny and slavery. And yet they're up there doing whatever everybody clamors for, which is a handout. So we find these good candidates. How do we do that? Well, every time there's an election and there's candidates, we invite them to come to our meeting and to complete our survey. Now, anybody can cheat on a survey. We've had plenty of candidates get coached on how to fill it out, and they looked really good. Uh, but, you know, if we can pepper them with questions for 45 minutes, it's not going to stand up. So you do not get an OCPAC endorsement unless you do the survey and you come speak to us so that we can find out if you really know what you're talking about. Once we find those candidates, then we support those candidates, and that's where the PAC money comes in. Uh, we have given some candidates 2000 3000 up to five, the $5,000 maximum. Now, uh, a Senate district or a House district requires a different amount of money depending on where it is. A candidate who lives in the sticks might be able to win a House seat on $5,000. And a candidate in the city might need $90,000 just to compete with the Chamber of Commerce money. Who's gonna, they're going to pump their money into the progressive candidate who likes economic development and socialism. So we try to be very strategic with our money. We find a good, righteous candidate, and they have a shot to win. And then we load up on them and say, let us knock doors, let us make phone calls, send out good postcards, and we want to get them in the house. Let me go, let's see what time it is. Okay, I have time for a rabbit trail. How many of you are from, are we all a lot of Christians in here? Are you familiar with the term, the remnant? What that means is that there's really only a few of us. Only a few of us who really get what it means to be fully in a right relationship with God and what it means to be a soldier for God, to truly be salt and light. And so when you step into your church building, whether there, there's 40 people there or 400 people there, even in that church building, friends, there's a remnant inside there. Most of those folks are clueless. They're sheep without a shepherd. They may be going to be in heaven with you, but the light bulb ain't on down here. There's only a few of us that get it. And I've come to learn that that is true in, in every circle whether it's a church or a school or a community or a neighborhood or the legislature. So I don't cry anymore that we only have four, five, six guys at the Capitol who are part of the remnant because that's just the way it's always been. But we have to make sure that we keep them there and that we keep them strong. If we fold up our tents and go home, there won't be a remnant at the Capitol anymore. And tyranny will spile out of control all the more faster and will lose more freedoms all the more faster. So thank God for people like Nathan Dom and Jason Murphy and Dan and Sally and the rest of them. They're our remnant. And this legislative cycle is about replacing them as they are term limited and tired out and given up. We've got to put a new remnant in at the Capitol. And so we're supporting those candidates that we have found over the summer that we have been interviewing candidates and then finally what we do is we hold legislators accountable. What happens when a guy comes to us and says wonderful things and we give him 2,000 bucks and he gets elected and then he stabs us in the back? There has to be a way to let people know that this is not a guy who is holding the standard up of what good government is about. And so that's where we come in with the conservative index. I brought a few copies of the conservative index to, to just pass around the room in case you haven't heard of that or ever seen it before. 
the conservative index has been in publication for what 30 something years is that right since 1979 and so about 17 or 18 years ago the publishers of the Oklahoma Constitution newspaper were looking for a way to involve more grassroots activists in the conservative index they wanted a way to make it more open more transparent um, and make sure that that it actually did reflect conservative values and so they teamed up with OC PAC and they brought us in and ever since that has, it has been our job actually to select the bills that will go on the index and so it's a wonderful process of debating which bills to put on the index, discussing that and the ramifications, and then creating this scorecard for every senator and every representative in the state. It comes down to 10 bills, and each bill is worth 10 points. So it's like being in school for these guys, and they're getting this grade from 0 to 100%. And you can, after so many years of history of the conservative index, you can see how consistent it is. You can look at those lifetime averages of the guys at the top, and you know they're part of the remnant. And the ones in the middle just kind of are swaying in the breeze, going with whatever the path of least resistance is. And the guys at the bottom, they have values. They have core principles. They're really wrong. And they're dangerous. And they're the ones that we most need to unseat. So you'll be able to look on there and find your own representative, your own senator, and see how they scored. The first column is what they did this last legislative cycle. And then the second column will be their lifetime average. We just average all of the years that they've been in the legislature. So that's also a great tool to help us accomplish our mission. Now there's other things we do, lobbying and getting involved on particular issues, and I won't go over all that, but these are the main things that we do that keep us busy throughout the year trying to have influence. On that conservative index, we're trying to pick bills that represent these core values. Let me say this. There are a lot of groups, uh, and the media is really bad about this. They're very interested in talking about whether something is hard right or hard left. Is it liberal? Is it conservative? Is it Republican? Is it Democrat? The way I frame what we do at OCPAC doesn't have anything to do with parties or left or right. Folks, we believe we are right as in correct we believe we are right now we might be wrong but I seriously doubt it because we are looking at universal standards of God so when I argue for a bill and I say that uh, you know when I say we're for free markets versus economic development this is not a cost versus benefit analysis this is based on the fact that it's wrong to take one person's property against his will and then give it to another person and give him an advantage over his competition with the guy's own money. This is what economic development does. So this is not R versus D, left versus right. This is moral versus immoral. And I can make that argument on all these different issues. Education, uh, government transparency and, account and accountability, fiscal responsibility. You know, our state constitution, for example, says that we will have a balanced budget. You know how, okay, so that's money in, money out. They're supposed to equal, right? So what happens is we have this much money in, but they want to spend this much. Well, the constitution says it has to be balanced. So how do they balance it? They borrow the difference. They borrow the difference. And they go, oh, look, now it's balanced. Money in, money out. Do you see the problem here? That's not really a balanced budget. And to make matters worse, they borrow the money illegally. The state constitution says you can't borrow money. You can't go into debt without a vote of the people at a general election. And they do it every time. They did it for the, the Pop Museum and the museum in Tulsa. Um, those are just some of the recent examples. Uh, there was a $200 million bond this year to balance the budget that is not going to go to a vote of the people. So this is not left or right. This is correct or wrong. Righteous versus sinful. That's the basis on which we make this index. And so if they say, ah, oh, it's just, you know, it's a score. I got 60%. That's passing. That's not bad. Well, no, that means you were engaged in sin 40% of the time. I mean, that's the way I look at it. So, very important. What could you do to make a difference? Um, I see a lot of members of OCPAC sitting in here. 
A lot of you folks. Love you guys. Brothers in arms. But some of you didn't know we existed and didn't know what we were about. And you can have more influence than you have by just debating and talking about the ideas like we used to do 26 years ago, you can get involved with us. I would ask you to consider uh, studying and sharing our weekly news digest and commentary. If you're not getting it already, just go to Facebook, put in Oklahoma Conservative Political Action Committee and find us, join the group. Or you can send me an email and I'll add you to the, to the MailChimp email distribution thing where it ends up in your spam folder. That's why I really like people to join Facebook. But you can share that because it's like, it's like sharing a sermon that you liked or, or sharing an essay that you read that you thought was really important. You know, these are the kinds of things that your close friends and family, if you share them, will probably read them because they came from you. You can educate yourself and vote the right way. I get sick and tired of pastors and preachers and talking heads in the media saying, oh, the important thing is just that you go vote. Exercise your civic duty. That's what it's all about. Go and vote. No! Don't go vote unless you know what you're voting for. Don't go vote unless you're going to vote the right way. How do you know the right way to vote? Ask Jerome. Ask Don. Ask me. Read the OCPAC email. For years, Charlie has been publishing Charlie's picks before every election. That's how to vote. So uh, he and I do those together. And so if we have a difference of opinion, we'll weigh in and you'll have to decide. But man... Pass Charlie's picks around before this next election. We'll talk about all the state questions. We'll talk about all the state uh, offices, uh, Senate and representative. Most people don't know how to go vote. Uh, we were the morning of the morning of the uh, of the primary runoff election here a few weeks ago. And a friend of mine who goes to the lake with me and goes camping with me and we go to church together and we're raising our kids together. And Tuesday morning, I sent him a text and said, make sure you go vote today. And he went, oh, well, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to vote. And that pastor, Paul Blair, up in Edmond, I've heard really bad things about him. He's like an extremist, isn't he? I have failed. Somehow I have failed. But I share this story with you because you're in the same boat. Your friends and your family members at church don't have a clue Unless you will open your mouth and talk about religion and politics. I know we're in the middle of football season. And you can say, hey, how about them fill in the blank? But then after that, ask them how they're going to vote on November the 8th and say, can I send you Charlie's picks? You can educate others and ask them to vote the right way. I've been saying that. If you live here in the metro, we'd love to have you come on Wednesdays to our church services over at Mama Roja. Noon to one every Wednesday. A lot of you go to a congregation on a Sunday morning, and maybe you sometimes feel like I feel. There's got to be more than this. Three songs and a prayer, and a wonderful word from the scripture, but nothing on how it can change my culture, or apply to real life, to help protect my children. I, there's got to be more, right? OC Pack and our physical in-person meetings like this function like a church service. It's education, it's encouragement, it's socialization. And so a lot of you are here today because you're retired and you don't have to be someplace else, which likely means you have the same story going on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. So on Wednesday, come be with us. We'd love to have you. We average 46 people in attendance. And so to have that bump up to 50 would just be a blessing. And the Mexican food ain't bad there either. And then please, I would encourage you to join Oak Pack. Everybody take one of these with you when you go. Our basic membership is $50 a month, and it helps fund all these things that I've been talking about. Per year, per year. Per year. Did I say a month? If you can give $50 a month, we can do that too. <laughs> like $50 a month. As president, I hereby increase the rates effective immediately. <laughs> Charlie used to always say that he was a benevolent dictator. So I'm going to have to come up with some catchphrase like that for myself. <laughs>